Hello and welcome to another episode of Attacking Third, a CBS Sports Soccer Podcast. I'm Sandra Herrera, lead NWSL writer for CBS Sports. Joined today, as always, by my colleague and co-host, Lisa Roman, NWSL analyst and broadcaster. On today's episode, we are going to be chatting about the first ever CBA in women's soccer history. NWSL ratifies the first ever CBA, and let's get into it. But first, a quick reminder to follow us on Twitter for all breaking news at Attacking Third. If you're listening to this as a podcast, please go ahead and give us a five-star rating and review. It takes just a second, and it really helps us out so much. Whether you're on Apple Podcasts or Spotify right now, go ahead and leave us that five-star rating and review. Thank you so, so much. Lisa, what a historic time. I'm glad we're going to get to talk about this together. Sandra, I have not stopped smiling since the news broke and and the tweet from the Players Association came out. Um, This is historic. This is huge news. This has been months and months and months and months of meetings and negotiations, and it all comes together on the night before preseason starts, how historic and how beautifully poetic that is. But hey, it happened for the players because of the players. And I'm pumped to actually talk about it and break it down a little bit with you and get your thoughts on all of the details of this CBA that happened. How are you feeling? Are you excited? Do you have butterflies like I do? Yeah, I'm hyped. I'm hyped. You know, I um, I know you and I on this show and in this space of. Uh, been doing our best this off season, right? To keep to keep track of this CBA, to, to you know, in, in make sure that our listeners are engaged as much as much as possible. Uh, you know, we've had uh, executive director of the NWSL Player Association, Megan Burke, on a few times. We've had several player representatives on at some point throughout the duration of uh, of our show's existence. Really, not even just during the off season, um, but really within the middle of the the 2021 season, and now heading into this uh, 2022 season and just sort of going back and forth and uh, really getting a chance to engage with them and chat with them about their experiences uh, at the negotiating table to now finally getting to this point. Uh, it's, it's absolutely epic. I love it. I'm incredible. I, I saw the news come in the middle of the night. I was thrilled. I know you were thrilled and um, it just was a, a very, very nice moment. It was absolutely coming down to the wire for sure. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about deadlines and timelines and how this thing sort of came to light. Um, but uh, I love it. Uh, you know, just the at a personal angle in it, it, it just made me feel all nice and warm and fuzzy inside. You know, my, my grandfather was a union man, worked in the mills all his life. Uh, you know, my mother's uh, a preschool teacher. She's an educator, part of the teachers union here in Chicago. So uh, I was raised up in a union. I'm a, I'm a union granddaughter, a union daughter, and um, I'm incredibly thrilled for these players and to sort of be able to bear witness, right, to this, this historic moment. Even if we didn't necessarily have a part in it ourselves, just to be able to bear witness to that is a very, very special moment. Uh, but it's official. Players union and the NW still have ratified the very first collective bargaining agreement in women's soccer history. Let's chat a little bit maybe about the time it all came to light in the middle of the night. Uh, the Players Association breaking the news a little bit uh, on late evening ahead of the start of February 1, 10th uh, year for NWSL, 8.30 p.m. Eastern on January 31st. Uh, the Players uh, Association saying that they're going to go ahead and uh, – report to preseason on February 1. Just a week ago, exactly seven days, the union put out a statement saying uh, that they really wanted to have a CBA in place, that there were discussions uh, about not reporting to preseason if the contract was not put in place. And then here we are seven days later saying that uh, the they, they ratified and that they still needed approval at the, at the moment to go ahead and have the first ever collective bargaining agreement in NWSL history. Uh, and then a really weird hour of time, right? A little bit of like sort of felt like in limbo because there wasn't necessarily a statement from the league at this point because there was this little uh, verbiage within that that people were fixated on that it's subject to approval, right? Mm-hmm. From the NWSL board. And I think folks were st- Still almost waiting for another shoe to drop. Uh, But then just an hour later, uh, the league put out a statement saying that, yes, the league and the PA have agreed to the first ever CBA, but it was still subject to a uh, 
just some legal things, a final approval from the NWSL Board of Governors. But it was an exciting evening, to say the least. It was very exciting. And as this news unfolded it was i think that's so important to touch on that as this happened um there was like celebrations across the internet and across twitter and in my living room uh just celebrations for these players to be able to come to an agreement and then it was the caveat of okay it's still subject to final approval by the nwsl board of governors but the way that the Players Association put out this information and then even when the NWSL ultimately put out this statement, it was almost like it's just a matter of time before they approve this. It's It's been, what, over 400 meetings and negotiations between the Players Association and the board of directors for the league that have come to these conclusions and uh, really cutting it so close. Just the day before preseason, we know that based on social media and, and the players uh, seeing them, they are most of them are already in market. They've a lot of them have reported to do their medical examinations this past few days and today, February 1st, being the very first official day of preseason. So that means the players are in uniform, lacing up their boots and stepping onto the field. So any medical um, evaluations and, and screenings that need to be done have already happened. So a lot of players were in market and still kind of with waiting with bated breath to see if this would get approved, if they could come to a conclusion. And I'm sure it happened earlier in the day. And by the time you can get it all written out and the nice graphics for Twitter, for the NWSL players, Twitter, and you get it out there. It seems like for fans and, and for media that were just watching this unfold, that it was happening so quickly. But of course, on the other side of the coin, it does happen quickly, but then it's almost like a hurry up and wait situation. They they had all these negotiations. They came to the conclusion. They submitted their final approval. And then it was like, OK, let's wait until we can announce this, until we do it correctly. Um, and I think they did it very correctly because my Twitter was blowing up at 845 last night. It was like winding down for bed for me and I was like nope let's go we got to fire up we got to see what's going on um and it, it was a lot and even in the initial tweets from the players association they were putting out some of the details some of their biggest celebrations that they were oh, yeah. highlighting which I thought that was so so fun and so cool because we've known that these conversations have been happening and the latest that was reported on seven days ago, exactly one week before preseason started, was that there were still details that were being ironed out, including free agency, including how long this CBA would last. That was stated a week ago by the, the Players Association, what details they were still trying to figure out. And yeah. so in this initial announcement, they touched on those details and they gave fans and players the answers. Yeah, you know, it was... I, I think having that was lingering, I think, in the back of everybody's mind, you know, the yeah. fact that there was a bit of a deadline that was put on things, at least on the Players Association side of things. Right. Knowing that February 1st was literally the following day that this was the day this was like a little bit of a decision day scenario for this to get done, knowing that if it wasn't taken care of in this night that. Players were not going to report uh, for, for preseason uh, the following day. So I think there was a little bit, I don't want to say a lot of anxiety, but I'm sure that there was for some folks uh, throughout uh, January 31st, like wondering when it's going to happen, if it's going to happen, uh, is this going to be one of those midnight hour kind of breakthroughs? And it was in the evening, and thankfully it wasn't at the midnight hour. Um, and then I know us here at Attacking Third, you know, re reporting that, there were some things there in coming into play right earlier that afternoon. I had reported out there that things like free agency and things like contract terms were coming together. And those were some of the biggest hurdles that we've heard from, from players and, and sort of wanting to come to life in this CBA. And you had to imagine that if those were two things that were sort of coming together and finding some agreements upon that there was a really strong possibility that things were going to get hammered out. And luckily uh, that ended up uh, being true, but it was, you're correct. We're, we're, we were watching it happen almost in real time. Lisa it's like they put out the players put out this statement and then it was like a thread that they started putting together uh, of some of the details mm -hmm. within this newly ratified CBA, which uh, will last through the next five years. So through the 2026 20, season, 
160% increase in minimum salary, which is probably the biggest one, right, that they started out with. Uh, it's going to be bumped to $35,000 with a 4% year over year increase. So that raises the minimum salary by almost 60%, an average increase by more than 30% to $54,000 compared to the 2021 season. There's also some step ladder increases in 2022 salaries in order to protect players above the minimum in 2021. There's also going to be uh, things like a 401k plan with matching contributions from the league beginning in 2023 and also minimum standards for housing stipends. Uh, and it's it's a lot. If it seems like a lot, those are big percentages for people. It is a lot. I mean, in, in terms of the mm -hmm. The NW cell release side of things, they cited exactly that a lot of the primary terms that um, were agreed to. It's project, uh, projected to require additional incremental investment by NWSL owners uh, of nearly $100 million. Uh, and I think the biggest points of these that we've been chatting a little bit about throughout uh, off seasons here is, uh, is free agency, Lisa. And there's a little bit of a step ladder in this one in progress. There is. I think free agency is something that players have been pushing for and and sources even told The Athletic that um, the league was hoping that it wouldn't take a effect until 2024. However, in the CBA, it says that free agency is going to start in 2023 with players uh, that have a minimum of six years of service. And then that number will drop in 2024. So free agency will be eligible for players with a minimum of five years of service playing in the league. And there's also restricted free agency starting in 2024 with players with three service years. Um, and then I think that the free agency is fantastic for these players but even the restricted free agency which is similar to any other league meaning a player can sign with a new team however but their current team can match that offer and, and keep them around it's not set in stone yet um, but this compromise in the CBA is something that uh, was one of the decisions that probably came down to the last few days and and really uh, hammering out those details of that because the league didn't want free agency to start until 2024 and the yeah. CBA is starting in 2023 for those players that have given six years. Um, so that's fantastic. Like that is already turning a new stone in this CBA. Um, and, and the CBA will last for five years through the 2026 season. Uh, so that's a deadline and, and a timeline that is really good and obviously a compromise between both sides of this. Um, there's also uh, a caveat and, and an asterisk in this for waived players, because we've talked with players before and we've heard the stories that they get waived or they get traded and it's like, okay, pick up and leave. You have to, you're, you're out of your housing. You no longer have a salary and get out of here. Give us back all of the clothes and get out. So it's, um, in this CBA, it says that there's four week severance pay, uh, plus 30 days of housing and health insurance for any player that is waived. Um, and that 30 days and four weeks comparable to each other, but that does so much for a player. It allows them a chance to breathe after they've just been waived from their job. The fact that like they didn't have that before is mind blowing to me that you could yeah. just be waived, essentially fired from your job not necessarily for cause and that's it you are just cut off completely from that moment forward so i think yeah. the the free agency is huge and then players getting waived and having a little bit of stability after that to find their footing and figure out what's next if 30 days uh, with insurance as well which for professional athletes that's necessary no that's that's huge I, I think that was one of the biggest pieces of the details that that were coming out that really struck me um just because of so many of the things that we've read that have been reported about players in, in, in the past and them being waived, um, players who have come on here and talked about that or in, in other spaces, four weeks severance pay and 30 days um, housing and health insurance is, is huge considering that you're coming from a place where there was zero of that in existence. I think it goes right along. It's 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 right in line with a lot of maybe some of the, the player safety initiatives that, that uh, the Players Association was really sort of bargaining for at these tables. So that included, the, yes, the four-week severance pays and housing, but also, uh, you know, a bump in, in workers' comp coverage, uh, up to six months of paid mental health leave. Um, that includes eight weeks of parental leave, whether it's 
for birth or adoption, uh, clean private nursing facilities for, for parents in NWSL, uh, professional minimum staffing standards for healthcare professionals, and uh, no more playing on fields that require substantial conversions to the dimensions of a soccer field and uh that's big too because there have yeah. been moments in the past where there have not been ideal playing surfaces for the players of this league uh in in prior events or in prior facilities uh, we're talking about in the really really early days too and even as early as is last season um yeah, playing in, in baseball fields or, or smaller collegiate type of fields. Uh, so that, that was a huge one, I think, as well. That's that's another thing that I'm like, this shouldn't have to be clarified, but clearly it, it does, that they need to play on actual soccer fields because although – it has already been announced and already changed. Um, last year, Kansas City Current, their home field was uh, Legends Field, and that was a, a baseball field, as well as O.L. Rain. They were playing in Cheney Stadium. Now, Kansas City has already announced that this season they will play in Children's Mercy Park, and O.L. Rain has already announced that they will be playing their home games in Lumen Field, which is the home of the, the Seahawks and the Sounders. But that wasn't the case last year, and it was – a big difference. I mean, so many times when we watched games that Kansas City was playing at home at Legends Field, the dimensions were so small. The field was super bouncy and the ball, you yeah. could see it just watching the games and talking with coaches and players before the matches. They said, hey, we are going to play at home at Kansas City. Um, for Kansas City, that's an advantage for them. And for away teams coming in, they are at a disadvantage with how narrow the field is and how bouncy it is. So that's like a baseline that I feel like should have already been established. But right, like so many of these things, player safety should have already been established. Um, but yeah. the start of the 10th season of the NWSL, it's it's in writing, right? Ink to yeah. ink to paper, and and there are signatures, and there's a CBA, thankfully. But there are so many small details of the CBA and the deals that are mind blowing, but so necessary. And it's you know, and that's part of why it's a big deal, and that's part of honestly, uh, quite frankly, why why it feels that shocking. It, it wasn't those substandards were allowed because the CBA wasn't in existence. Yeah. There wasn't anything that players or, you know, fans or casual fans or folks within the space could point to and say, this is not acceptable. It was, other than just doing the eye test and knowing the game of soccer and knowing that playing on a baseball field probably isn't ideal uh, playing. I mean, we can even continue with, with using the raise example, using something like Memorial field was a, a struggle uh, for, mm -hmm. for them to, for, for opposition to, to play on. And it wasn't ideal for uh, rain players themselves, you know, it was often talked about a, as a place that was a difficult place to go in and play and win for multiple reasons, not just the dimensions, but just the overall surface. Um, you know, and that includes even the early days of Chicago Red Stars playing at Benedictine University, uh, the early days of FC Kansas City. There was just a lot that was coming into play, but nothing in existence, nothing in place, nothing in writing to say that actually this is not uh, acceptable. And that's part of the huge reason is why this is so uh, important that now there is a contract in place uh, and to ask players to, to play on a playing field that is, uh, you know, has substantial uh, dimensions is in breach of contract. So that's, uh, these are things that can be pointed to now. Um, I do appreciate that uh, even in some of the, the miss the two hour window that took place last night uh, between the players uh, announcing this and then the league also uh, acknowledging it um, was sort of their, their sign off right on this, this Twitter thread that they put um, to the players that came before us. We stand on your shoulders and we hope we uh, make you proud. Um, that's significant, right? That's something that we've heard um, throughout the duration of these negotiations, uh, especially I think, you know, mid season, um, when we started to see a lot of the reporting coming out about um, players uh, from the past and, and their past experiences in these uh, in certain environments throughout the league. Um, and then it's sort of the CBA negotiations almost, they didn't completely change, but they started to sort of become this bigger 
all encompassing thing where it's like, yes, things like uh, increase in pay, things like uh, the, the concept of a free agency market, you know, contract terms like, yes, those were things that were being discussed and negotiated. But alongside that, things like ensuring player safety, uh, ensuring that environments are, you know, not abusive or toxic. Right. Uh, these were all things that sort of like came came and got pulled in to. Uh, these contract negotiations. We heard several times on this podcast when we had guests that player safety became the most important thing uh, to sort of have in front of everything else going on within these negotiations for a potential CBA. Uh, and within that, knowing that they had all of these previous players and stories, former horror stories, really, mm -hmm. um, from players to sort of look at and sort of build on, I thought um, it was a very sincere touch to sort of sign off on some of the things and details that they were ratifying um, within this uh, initial CBA. I think it's so positive that they recognize that this CBA today, uh, or yesterday rather, in at the start of the 10th season of the league would not be possible if not for the women that have played the 10 years prior, the, the players that have given their all fought for uh, the league and played on those conditions that weren't so great. Because even you think we just talked about field dimensions and if it was the choice between playing on a baseball diamond in Chicago rather or anywhere versus not having a team in that market. These players said, okay, we'll play on this baseball diamond. We'll play in not ideal situations. And it's thanks to that. And due to those players doing so much of that, that allows the CBA to be passed right now and allows the different terms to be looked at, highlighted, circled, and saying, this is what we need to do better for the future. So it's so fitting. And and the players that are on the board or, or in the Players Association that are those vocal leaders, Tori Huster being one of them, Breva Sally is another one that is in, in those meetings a lot of times, saying, oh, we recognize all the work that these other players have done ahead of us, and we're just here to kind of tie up the final strings. And that's so self-aware of these players to be able to recognize that. And even having someone like Megan Burke who understands who, who played and who understands both sides of it to really lean on Burke as an executive director to say, what can we do to make this better? Um, but throughout this CBA and all of the different terms, there are a number of things that stuck out to me. Um, of course, the free agency and that the CBA will last five years. I mean, that's huge as well. But one of the the biggest things for me was um, the medical requirements that the CBA put into place. So it's it states that the league will hire a medical director, uh, but now that individual teams and clubs must provide the services of, at a minimum of a team physician, a massage therapist, a sports scientist, a sports psychologist, and a team clinician to really focus on mental health for mm -hmm. these players. So not only do the players get up to six months mental health leave if they need it, but they also have the resources at their disposal in their own home market and their club to use those mental health resources. And, and everything from players need mental health resources for a million different reasons. And we saw those firsthand throughout the 2021 season. However, it also comes down to not getting playing time. That can affect a player's mental health and, and their physical health as well in turn. So it's just a snowball of effect that it is something that really stood out to me in this. Um, and, and also that the revenue sharing, I think that's really huge to kind of give players a cut of the profit that they make. Um, it, it says that, there's incentive now for the NWSL players to build together revenue sharing. So if the league is profitable in seasons 20, through 2024, 2025, or 2026, that the players will receive a cut of the broadcast revenue. So that's more incentive for the players to play well, to get fans out, to do things like that. And, and we saw teams doing that in Angel City, giving their players a cut of the ticket sales. But now that it's become a league-wide part of this CBA, I, that's a huge aspect of this bargaining agreement that really stood out to me to benefit the players.
No, absolutely. And it's again, we're going through some of these details of, of the CBA and there's part of it where it's like, I'm sure there are perhaps listeners or people watching this thinking, God, like that wasn't in place already, but you know, mm-hmm. shocking. Yes. Like it's not thing, things like a def- actual defined season, uh, vacation time and leave, you know, though these were things that were not again uh, in writing or, um, you know, so available for something to, to point to point at, uh, you know, you, you go start a new job somewhere. And then one of the first things they do is give you a, a handbook. Right. And it's just kind of like, well, like where what do we have to to look at here but um yeah i think the parental leave is also something that that's really huge uh, for me too whether it's birth or adoptive parents uh the way that they're going to get leave the way that they're going to get uh continued salary if if you are even just going through your pregnancy um all of these things are valuable in terms of when we're when we're looking at overall health when we're looking at overall wellness and well-being of of the players um in this league. Um, and it's just, uh, I, I love that. I love the fact that there was that little sort of extra tidbit of something like, um, revenue sharing, right. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And, um, even with the conditions, um, in terms of having to, to make sure that comes into play only if the league finds itself profitable during year three or year four or year five of this particular CBA. Um, so little things like that where, you know, players are sort of, you know, taking a look at, at a CBA, taking a look at things in place to where they can still find these little pieces of the pie, right? Being able to, uh, you know, find a dictating point and say like, well, you know, we're you're putting us on the broadcast. So, you know, let's talk a little bit about revenue share. You know, that's, that is quite frankly smart, you know, not to, to minimize that or, or have lack of a better word. It just is it's a smart, intelligent thing to have and include um, in this first ever uh, CBA, which comes now in the 10th year for NWSLs. It's approaching a, a decade uh, in existence, which that in itself is also something that needs to be celebrated. Uh, again, first ever CBA in women's soccer history. Two previous uh, women's uh, attempts at women's pro leagues in this country, uh, both, uh, you know, folding and forfeiting uh, their their leagues and it's just uh it's it's a tough history to maybe sometimes go back and, mm-hmm. and revisit you know um even just looking at the current landscape i mean there are there are players in nwsl right now who can look back at wps yeah. you know and and point and say they remember when that's kind of got taken out from under them you know and they came back home uh, from an Olympics where they won a gold medal and no longer had a league, you know? Yeah. So it's, um, it's a, it's a tough and painful past and history to look at at times, but it um, it absolutely is a necessary part of the narrative. I think when we're taking a look at uh, a look at everything as a whole, in terms of this, you know, talking about it as a very historic moment, because that is what it is. And it is something that should be celebrated. And it is, we are looking at uh, a lot of different reaction across the league, whether it's from, from current players, former players, um, great statement out there currently from Yael Averbush, again, a player who wasn't in to be selling, helped sort of found the players association in 2017 to now sort of having uh, this CBA and being on the other side of it, right. Being on the NWSL, um, side of things. And it's just sort of, uh, kind of beautiful to sort of see how things come full circle like that. So I want to thank everybody for joining us. And listening today, uh, if you are looking for more details, we've got that for you over on CBS Sports. If you're looking for the written version and how to find details on the CBA uh, contract, you can go ahead and find that on cbssports.com. Uh, thank you all for listening. If you've enjoyed what you heard, you can follow us on Twitter at Attacking Third. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and anywhere you listen to your podcast shows. You can leave us a five-star review on Spotify now. And if you have any questions for us, you can leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts with your question, and Lisa and I will answer it during our mailbag segment. We're also available as video. Please subscribe to us on YouTube. Visit youtube.com slash attacking third. And we'll be back tomorrow with more coverage of CBA negotiations, how we got here, and exclusive interviews for Sandra Herrera and Lisa Roman. This was Attacking Third. <laughs>